Uh, good afternoon, I'm Brandon Singer, Supervising Fisheries Biologist for the Department of Southern Region. Uh, in Nevada, we have a unique uh, native fish assemblage. Um, some of our fish are more well known, like the hunting cutthroat trout, uh, and the bull trout that occur in the northern part of the state. Um, but down south, we have a much different group of native fish. Um, some of our species are like the razorback sucker that are, grow almost three feet long, native to the Colorado River, and have a huge uh, historic range from Wyoming down to Mexico. We have another small group of uh, native fish that are much smaller in size and much more isolated. Um, the devil's hole pupfish I'm going to talk about today is kind of on the extreme end of the isolation. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's small size. Yeah, so we uh, work closely with the National Park Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to manage Devil's Hole and the Devil's Hole pupfish. Um, Devil's Hole is actually an adjunct site of the Death Valley National Park. Um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is involved because the pupfish is endangered. And they also run the Ash Meadows Fish Conservation Facility, which I'll talk about in a minute. So Devil's Hole pupfish, um, it perhaps has the most restricted uh, habitat of any vertebrate species on earth. It is only found in Devil's Hole. Um, Devil's Hole is a very harsh aquatic environment. Um, the species has adapted some unique traits uh, over the years to live in that um, environment. It's a very small fish. It has a very small, uh, shallow body. Um, it actually lacks pelvic fins. Um, and it's reduced activity and reduced aggression compared to some of our other related pupfish species. Um, that's kind of indicative, indicative of living in a harsh, metabolically expensive environment. And it's small. It only gets an inch long, 25 millimeters. Um, it's sexually dimorphic. The males are the stunning blue color. Females are a bit more drab, a little olive color, a little bit of blue mixed in. Um, generally with fish, larger the fish is, more eggs it lays, and the longer the lifespan. Smaller fish have short lifespans and lay fewer eggs. Uh, Devil's Hole Puffish is kind of on the extreme end of that. It lays a single egg per spawning event, and it lives to be about a year old. About 8 to 12 months is its average age. Uh, it's endangered, and its diet uh, is mostly consists of algae. So Devil's Hole, it's about an hour and a half west of the Las Vegas Valley, just on the other side of Pahrump. Um, if you were to fly over to take a drone across it, you just see this hole in the ground. Um, the picture above it is what the actual water surface looks like. Uh, the blue part is open water. We can see down into the cavern. Um, that bottom part where all the green is is, sh is a shallow shelf. It's about a foot deep. Um, and it actually gets algae that grows on it. That arrow is pointing uh, at that shaded area in the hole. And that shaded section is really important. Um, I'll get to that in a few slides, but that kind of is the driver of the ecosystem. So that, that area where you have the algae growth is a shallow shelf, or we call it the spawning shelf. Um, it's about a foot deep, uh, three and a half meters wide, and about five meters long. That's the primary spawning ground for the devil's hole pupfish. Most of the spawning activity occurs there. There's another shelf about 15 feet down. Um, they'll spawn on there too, but the, the bulk of the spawning activity occurs on the shelf. Uh, the photo on the right was taken about 60 to 70 feet down in devil's hole, kind of looking up at the sunlight. Um, so the system opens up a lot, but it's very narrow. It's essentially a long crack. The photo on the top right is what the uh, spawning shelf looks like underwater. And so that's a photo that was taken in the summer. It's got nice algae growth on it. Um, that diagram kind of shows a, a cross, cross view of what the system looks like underwater. So that shelf is there on the left. The open water is to the right of that. Um, and those numbers indicate the zones. When we do our counts, we break up the underwater portion into zones. And so we have four uh, four zones. And that photo on the left was taken. Um, that horizontal line above that number one is taken right about there and looking up kind of at an angle towards the surface. So I mentioned earlier that Devil's Hole is a, a very harsh environment and it's very unique. It's actually a limestone cavern. Um, an exposed aquifer. A lot of our native fishes in southern Nevada um, live, in, live in spring systems. Um, springs are groundwater as well, but they're flowing systems. So they come out of the ground, they flow, and they create a spring brook or a river. Um, Devil's Hole doesn't do that. It's just literally an exposed aquifer. The water is still um, all the time. So being an aquifer, the water's crystal clear. Um, it's a thermal system. Um, Year-round, whether you're at 10 feet deep or 110 feet, it's 92 to 93 degrees. Um, we get some uh, fluctuation up near the water surface and on the shallow shelf from ambient 
uh, air temperature in the winter and solar input during the summer. It's got very low dissolved oxygen. Most fish couldn't survive in uh, that little bit of oxygen. That's about half or less than half of um, what most aquatic systems are. It's got a neutral pH about 7.4. Um, it's a very energy limited system. Being in an aquifer and inside a hole, it doesn't get a whole lot of sunlight. Um, there's no canopy, riparian area, no tributaries that bring in nutrients. Um, very, very energy limited. Uh, one strange thing, it experiences tidal fluctuations, just like the ocean has a high tide and a low tide. Um, the tidal fluctuation is usually about six to eight inches. Um, it's 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Um, it's subject to stochastic events, flood events and earthquakes um, impact Devil's Hole throughout the year. It's extremely deep. Uh, divers have been beyond 400 feet. Um, they couldn't see the bottom. Nobody knows how deep it is. It's uh, believed to be the deepest underwater cave system in the United States and likely North America. So getting back to that, that shaded area, um, the shade or lack of solar energy is a driving factor in the ecosystem. Um, that figure on the left kind of shows the solar energy that the water level receives in the summertime. We have the max amount of uh, direct solar input in the winter. We have the least amount. Um, in the summer, it receives about four hours of direct sunlight. Uh, in the winter, we'll go two to three months without any direct sunlight. And so in the summer, we'll get a lot of algae growth. Um, you can see in that one photo with the, the middle photo with the algae, um, there's nice floating algae mats. The shallow shelf has good algae growth. Uh, the algae is important for food as well as cover of newly hatched fish. The other photo on the right uh, is during the winter. You can see the algae is gone. Um, it's a pretty bare, you know, there's not a lot of resources, not a lot of places to hide. And so that, you know, that kind of drives the ecosystem. So with that in mind, uh, in the summer, photosynthesis is kind of our main um, resource and energy producer. And in the winter, it's terrestrial carbon. Um, it's typically in the form of a dead brush material from native vegetation that gets blown in from wind. Um, but then throughout the year, we have other um, sources of terrestrial carbon and other inputs. Uh, that photo was taken about 30, 40 feet down in Devil's Hole. There's an owl that roosts above the water surface. Um, you'll find the, the bones of his food all over the place. Uh, we'll occasionally find lizards in Devil's Hole that have drowned. Um, we've seen birds, owls in there. And so animals like that, when you have a nutrient limited system, um, that, that little bit of the nutrients that you get throughout the year is very important. Uh, flood events, they can be good and they can be bad. Um, it all depends on the timing and the severity of the flood event. Um, some of the good things that they do is they'll uh, bring in leaf litter, sticks, um, you know, terrestrial carbon and provide additional in, uh, nutrient input. Um, sometimes we'll get old sediment that'll build up on the shelf. Uh, they can wash that stuff off and bring in a nice uh, diversity of substrate material. Um, and mild flood events, we actually see uh, um, an increase in fish activity. We'll see increased spawning behavior following one of those events. Um, but they also be bad depending on, you know, how severe the flood is. So you can see in that photo on the right, um, that handrail is almost completely submerged. That's about a three to four foot high handrail. So that's a tremendous amount of water going into Devil's Hole at that moment. Um, so what that what that can do, it'll it'll totally clear off all the algae um, that's on the shelf or floating algae mats. Um, then it'll also bring in a lot of deposited rock material, and that rock material will crush eggs, crush larvae, um, and then it'll also, depending on severity, will create these huge mounds of deposit material that you see on the right. Um, that material is actually exposed from the water right there, and so that resulted in about a reduction of one third of the available spawning habitat for the species. Um, so since we have the ability to intervene in situations like that, we do. We actually bucket that shelf off, or bucket that material off, um, hand it off to divers, and then we'll relocate it uh, 15 feet down um, below that shelf. Um, and when in that pile, it's hard to see in this image. I'm, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of sticks, leaves, and everything in that pile. And so that's why we don't remove it out of the system. We want to keep that uh, carbon, those nutrient inputs in Devil's Hole. And so obviously natural resource managers haven't been around since uh, Devil's Hole and these fish have. So the question is, how do, um, how do the system, you know, recover and maintain itself over the years with uh, events like this? And the answer is seismic, seismic events. Um, there's kind of this phenomenon in Devil's Hole where earthquake, earthquakes will create 
uh, what's called a setch, and that's essentially um, wave action. It's an oscillation in the water surface, and it looks looks like a wave. And what's really interesting about that is earthquakes from all over the world will create a setch at Devil's Hole. Um, Alaska, South America, um, Asia, Mexico, um, all of them, depending on the, the size and location, uh, will create a setch. And so this, uh, <clears throat> this photo here in 2017 was from an earthquake in southern, or southern Mexico near the Guatemala border. Um, and it was an 8.1 earthquake. And you can see before the setch, we had good algae mats, good algae growth. The following day, all that stuff is gone. It washed you know, all that stuff away. And so when you get deposited material and that, uh, that comes down the shelf, you know, these setches will occur and it'll distribute that uh, substrate throughout the system. Um, so luckily I got a video to show what one of these setches look like. Uh, this video is from this past July following the California um, earthquakes. We created two setches. Uh, this one is on the July 5th one. That was the stronger of the two. Um, there's going to be two viewpoints that we're going to see. There's this one from above the water level. Then we have a submerged camera um, that's looking at the shelf. Um, so when it's, when it's above the, the water level view, keep your eye on the water. There's going to be an owl flying around. Try not to pay attention to the owl too much. Go ahead, Doug. Start to see the water action. That's the shallow spawning shelf. So here's some before and after images of the, of the two setches. The one, the photo on the left uh, shows we had great algae growth on the shelf. Um, after that July 4 earthquake, it cleared most of the algae off. You can still see some left on there. Um, but following that July 5th setch, you know, it cleared everything off. That looks like freshly laid gravel on the left side of the shelf there. It scoured out a big hole. Um, so those things are very powerful and they have the, you know, the ability to, to do good and damage and clear off that substrate, but it also has obviously some effect to the fish. I'm gonna kind of switch gears here and start talking about some of the conservation and management history of the species. Um, Devil's Hole pupfish were first described by uh, ichthyologist Joseph Wales in 1930. Um, in 1952, it, the site became incorporated into what was then Death Valley National Monument and now Death Valley National Park uh, through executive order. Uh, President Truman proclaimed uh, Devil's Hole is of such outstanding scientific importance that it should be given a special should be given special protection evidenced by the presence in the pool of a peculiar race of desert fish. Uh, 1967 Devil's Hole pupfish became one of the first species uh, listed under what was then called the Endangered Species Preservation Act of 1966. It's now the Endangered Species Act. Um, this listing decision was largely a result of local groundwater pumping um, that caused the water level in Devil's Hole to drop. Um, so uh, some court battles ensued and uh, it ultimately reached the Supreme Court in 1976. The Supreme Court um, identified and ruled that a certain water level must be maintained uh, to keep the fish uh, alive. So if it made it to the Supreme Court, it probably was a pretty big deal, right? Um, the photo in, on the left in 1950 was before pumping. 
Um, then on the right uh, was a photo in 1973 about when Devil's Hole was almost at its lowest. So that on the 1973 photo, that big white mound towards the bottom is actually the, the shallow shelf, the spawning shelf. It's basically completely um, high and dry right there. Uh, just north of that uh, mound is actually an artificial shelf that scientists built at the time uh, to provide somewhere for the pupfish to spawn in. The uh, color photos of the, the 1970s and present day. Um, again, you can see those two uh, researchers on the left. Um, that rock they're sitting on is the end of the shallow sh shelf, and so the whole whole shelf, you know, is totally dry. And so, uh, in a system like Devil Soul and a fish as small as Devil Soul puffish, we don't use a lot of your standard fisheries management um, strategies to to survey the population. Um, we do a general population count and then something we call the early life stage survey and that targets uh, recruitment and reproduction throughout the year. Um, so for those early life stage surveys, we go out at night, uh, we deploy those white trays across the shelf. Um, each tray has a little measuring uh, ruler in it. Um, we basically just uh, count the early life stage fish that swim across uh, those PV, PVC trays and uh, measure them, and those fish are typically five to eight millimeters, um, less than a quarter of an inch. And then our, our methods for counting the main population, uh, we do a surface count, then we do an underwater count. Um, so for the surface count, we have three counters that go out on the walkway above the shelf. Uh, we split the shelf up into three sections, and then we count all the fish that we see um, on the shelf, and then we'll add that number to our underwater surveys, which we do through SCUBA. So we've been doing this survey method since uh, 1972. We do it uh, twice a year, once in the spring, once in the fall. Um, I mentioned those four levels earlier. A uh, diver will go across one level, count all the fish, and move on to the next level. Um, our dives are typically about 50 minutes. Uh, we'll go down to about 110 feet. Uh, we have two scientific divers that count the fish um, per dive. With it being an overhead environment and being in a big cavern system, trying to find uh, fish that are one inch or less, um, we actually have uh, safety divers assigned to each uh, scientific diver, and those safety divers are actually volunteers. Um, one of them is a cave diving instructor, another one's an um, open water scuba instructor, um, then a couple of them are on a Sheriff's rescue dive team. And then typically with uh, fish, when we sample populations, we like to capture them so we can get length data, um, have a better understanding of the population structure. Um, with a critically endangered fish like the devil's hole pupfish, uh, we don't like to capture them and handle them because it's just undue stress um, on the individuals. And so what we've come up with is this piece of equipment that we call the stereo video equipment. Um, and inside of those two PVC chambers, are a, a camera and they're kind of angled together towards the end of that rod um, and they're synced together. So we'll go down to where we start our dives, swim through the system and get video, um, video footage of the fish and then we'll upload that into a computer program. We can freeze the frames and we can measure uh, the fish with high accuracy doing it that way. So the groundwater pumping um, began in the early 1960s. A number of wells started popping up around Devil's Hole. Um, the number of uh, wells increased significantly uh, throughout that decade. In the late 60s, we started seeing the water level um, drop pretty quickly. Um, it kind of bottomed out there in the early 1970s. Um, groundwater pumping, uh, groundwater pumping uh, ceased in the early 70s um, through either voluntary measures or through court injunctions. Um, and as after it stopped, the water level in Devil's Hole started to recover pretty quick. Um, although, as you can see in that fig figure, it never fully recovered. And to this day, it still hasn't recovered at pre-pumping levels. Um, as water recovered, the population also um, kind of came up with the water levels. And the population remained stable through the late 70s to early 90s. But then in the mid-90s, we uh, started to see the population crash. Um, and the reasons for that decline remain fairly elusive at this point. Um, historically, funding for work on Devil's Hole was very limited. Um, and most of our work was focused on fish counts and fish health. And we weren't able to do a lot of ecosystem monitoring and collect a lot of uh, water quality data and that type of thing. Uh, 
Um, so we haven't been able to pinpoint exactly what it was, um, but looking at some of the limited research that was done, uh, we know there's a change in the ecosystem. In the late 60s, the dominant algae species was Spirogyra, and the dominant invertebrate was uh, ostracots. And then around 2000, that completely switched to um, a system dominated by filamentous cyanobacteria and these little critters called neos. Um, luckily, in recent years, uh, funding has increased, and so now we've kind of shifted our management approach, and we're taking more of an ecosystem um, approach to management and monitoring. Um, so now we look at a lot of things, uh, water temperature, water quality, substrate, uh, composition, algae composition, um, invertebrate composition. We are able to look at a lot of these ecosystem things that we couldn't do in the past, and uh, we can't, obviously can't go back in time and collect that data, um, but it's a good reminder of, uh, you know, it's important to monitor wildlife populations and their habitat in the good times and the bad times. Um, so the population continued to decline and uh, bottomed out in 2006 and 2007 at 38 pupfish. Um, in 2013, we hit a new low at 35 pupfish. Um, when we get down to less than 40 individuals of a species, um, you know, the fear of extinction is real. Um, that's a hard, hard thing to come back from. And uh, so in 2016, after we hit the 30 something pupfish, um, we started seeing fish very skinny and thin and not looking good in the winter time. In the winter time, you know, Devil's Hole is resource limited to begin with. And so we were, um, you know, very worried about them making it into the spring. And so we actually started uh, supplemental feeding the population for a couple of days. Um, that's far from an ideal situation to have to be feeding a wild population. Um, but when you're, you know, staring down the barrel of extinction, you got to do some things you don't want to do sometimes. So one of the more recent actions that we're uh, started doing and continue to this day are placing cover packets. And that's that kind of brush looking structure you see there on the shallow shelf. Um, using habitat structures is very common in sport fish management and other systems. And so this is kind of the devil's hole version of that. And that's actually a, a native plant from around Devil's Hole. Um, we'll sink that into the into Devil's Hole. Uh, promotes good algae growth, provides cover for young fish. Um, again, it's natural, so it'll decompose, um, provide carbon and uh, you know energy to the system. In recent years, uh, we have reason to be optimistic. And last year, in fall 2018, uh, our counts resulted in 187 pupfish. That was a 15-year high. Uh, this past spring, we counted 128 pupfish, and that was a 16-year high. Um, last weekend, we did our fall count. We counted 170. Slight decrease from 2018, but there's, you know, population variability is natural from year to year. Um, considering the, the massive such that we had in July, uh, we're feeling pretty optimistic. And the population size structure looked really good. There's only a few um, old, large fish. Most of them are um, very young and at their prime reproductive age. So the Ash Meadows Fish Conservation Facility, um, as that population was crashing uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, you know, we kind of thought about it and decided we probably should have a backup population um, just to have on hand. Um, and so they constructed the Fish Conservation Facility with the goal of uh, maintaining a secure backup population of Devil's Hole Puffish. Um, and so how, that, how this program works is we uh, use these things we call egg recovery mats. And we'll deploy those on the shallow shelf in Devil's Hole, let those soak for four to five days, we'll recover them and transfer them to the facility where they'll hatch the eggs out, rear the fish, and uh, hold them as a backup population. And so they kind of have two main rearing methods there. They have a room of aquaria, then they have a refuge tank. And so they use the aquaria uh, to hatch the eggs in and rear the larval fish. And once they get large enough size, we'll move those over into the uh, 110,000 gallon refuge tank. And it's actually a replica of Devil's Hole. The shelf is a, a measured rec replica of the shallow shelf. Um, we keep water conditions very similar to Devil's Hole, not quite as harsh. We keep it a couple degrees cooler. Um, and we it's not quite as low as DO. We bump the DO up a little bit just to make it a little easier environment and uh, um, encourage more survival. One interesting thing we found through this process is uh, 50% of the eggs that devil's hole pupfish lay aren't viable. So that means they either weren't fertilized when they were laid or they were fertilized and died very early um, in the development process. 
And so the eggs that are viable, we've had 80% survival um, at the fish facility. And they've also had reproduction and multiple generations now for the past several years since we've been starting this effort. And then the, the last uh, slide here, um, another unique thing about Devil's Hole inside of it, there's a air-filled room that doesn't have any access to the surface. Uh, so the top left photo is a crevice in the wall and divers can go through that crevice. Um, then that bottom left photo is kind of the, the Brown's room opening when you come out of it, that's kind of what you see. And then that photo on the right uh, is Brown's room itself and it's pitch black, the lighting is just from the flash of the camera. Um, so Devil's Hole is, you know, it's full of surprises and there's nowhere else in Nevada or the United States like it. And with that, I'll take any questions. Any questions? Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, that, that's interesting. I mean, you hear bits and pieces, but uh, that was really interesting presentation. So I appreciate you. Thank you. Coming in and giving it to us. So I have one real quick question. How many fish in your backup population? How many do you? Right, right now we have about a hundred. And there, and so annually they, they die and. Yep, just like the other, just like the wild population, uh, they're a little longer lived than the wild population because it's um, we keep the water a little cooler and a little better condition, so we can get 18 months instead of 12 months out of them. Do you ever get two reproductive cycles out of them, or they they do spawn several times a year? They do. So, yes, yeah, so they'll do three or four spawning events, um, but again, typically a single egg at a time. Okay. Yeah, I hope I didn't miss that. I was. Yeah, I, don't, I think I, I was sitting there thinking about how 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 tight their uh, life cycle is already and yeah. you know yeah makes sense. okay Thanks. thank you any other questions thank you very much that was uh you bet. thank you it's very interesting uh won't catch me diving in devil's hole not that i could dive but 